Hej, hello. Hallå. Hi, very welcome to the Public Art Agency, Statens Konstråd. My name is Magdalena Malm and I'm the director here. Um, tonight we have the second in a series of two uh, seminars. The last week was uh, on the theme of uh, urban pedagogy and trying to find uh, what kind of other ways are there or what other kind of strategies might there be for involvement in planning processes and, and empowerment in local situations uh, beyond the dialogues that we have talked about a lot. And tonight is another uh, question which is uh, artists' involvement in urban development projects. Um, we are doing these talks at the, at the Public Art Agency. We have an ongoing discussion amongst us about things that we find challenging or interesting that are on the verge of, of, of um, being problematic or have a large potential. And we sometimes invite guests to us um, in the office. And sometimes we like to share because we think that we, I know that a lot of you here have also your own experience of these issues. So it's interesting to open those dialogues and they are actually thought of more as investigations. It's not really statements. We have invite, we invite some guests who have some very interesting experiences or uh, theories or statements to make. But the idea is actually uh, to kind of together have a dialogue about those things. So there will be one part which is an introduction, introductions, and the other part is, is dialogue based. And why we're doing these two specific thematics is connecting to a mission at, at Updrag that we have to work in uh, domestic areas where with with lågt valdeltagande. I'm not so good at this English expression, but I would say with a where the uh, voting is not so high. Um, and uh, amongst them will be uh, million program areas around Sweden. That will start next year and this is like a, a, a way for us to both investigate and share uh, and collect uh, thoughts and experiences on this theme. And it has been, uh, uh, the program has been cu curated or, or arranged by Johanna Zaveja, who is the producer of urban development at Statens Konstrukt. And she will, uh, and she will be working very much with this program or this project uh, together with Lena Frum, uh, who is the head of the project. Uh, do you want to say something, uh, Lena, or how do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just join the stage when it's time for moderating the the well the speakers. I think. Right. So we'll start, Jana. <coughs> hello, hello, hello. <coughs> Welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Jana Zavia. As Magdalena mentioned, and I work at the Public Art Agency with Urban Projects, looking into the planning and the building of our public spaces. And these projects are pilot projects in which we try out new working methodologies, new forms of collaboration. We do this often by inviting artists into this process. And the reason the Public Art Agency does this work is both to encourage new platforms for contemporary art, but also to discuss and strengthen and try out ways of building public spaces. Uh, so we do these projects as collaborations uh, with uh, cities, municipalities, and property owners, uh, and we do them in all stages of building and planning. Uh, so we have some examples of uh, early planning stages, like Parklek i Sundbybari by Kerstin Bariendal, but also very concrete building phases or even demolition phases as the um, newly inaugurated memory scape logbook in Kiruna by Sofia Sundberg Kaltuikonen and Ingo Wetter. Uh, but we're not alone doing this kind of work. Municipalities and cities all over Sweden and abroad are more and more often inviting artists into city development uh, processes. And these works come in a variety of forms, but also with a variety of intentions. So, 
from investigating new ways of planning, like maybe more accessible planning or democratic planning, to projects aiming at marketing or branding. My own background is in architecture. And from this perspective, I can clearly see how some of these projects can create space for reflection in these otherwise quite formalized processes of planning uh, and building, uh, how they can create states of exceptions, they can try out new solutions, new forms of collaborations, um, <coughs> emphasis social and cultural aspects in planning. But what do they do in the long run? Or in the big scope? Can they change planning? Do they change the current protocols? Uh, should they? And this is the topic for tonight uh, that we'd love to discuss with you uh, and with our invited guests, uh, Johan Tiren and Anna Högberg, a collaboration of two artists with a long experience of working in local and regional planning processes, uh, and Lisa Fior, the co-founder of MAF, an art and architecture collaboration based in London, uh, working a lot in the public realm. And Helen Runting, uh, urban planner, urban designer, and a PhD student at KTH, looking into the relationship between art, relational architecture, urban development, neoliberalism. <laughs> uh, and we'll film the presentations. The discussion afterwards is not filmed, and I really hope you'll participate in it. Um, we want to thank Artrim Jungberg <laughs> for lending us this space, because usually we're upstairs. Uh, and then also, if you want to take part uh, of our newsletter, you can sign by the entrance. Pos uh, Jessica. Uh, yes, yeah, so welcome, Anna, Johan. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Thank you for being here. And we will try to do this in English. Your English is, is better than mine. No. I will speak no. Swinglish. And um, it's really good to uh, be trusted to be a voice in this really sort of problematized um, field <laughs> um, we're going into. So. Um, Anna Hagberg, you want to again? We're yes. artists with many years uh, of experience in the plan urban planning and uh, different kind of areas. Uh, most often we have been uh, speaking a lot uh, about actually in, in different contexts this uh, Atela et Samhälle project, uh, several years in the regional planning uh, office. And uh, we will not talk about this today, but uh, I think it's interesting because there we had a role as artists, together with two more artists, actually. Uh, and um, in a room where not so many enters. It's uh, a kind of closed off room that where decisions may are make, uh, where decisions make, where, we, where they make decisions yes, and uh, visions are uh, Yes, I think what, what was really <laughs> special here with this project was um, uh, that you, you quite often see artists uh, engaged in community-based projects within the local societies. Uh, what we uh, uh, entered in this uh, planning uh, project, together with the Office of Regional Planning at that time, was that we as artists entered, um, in a sense, higher up in the hierarchy, we can say. We entered uh, really the planning department and we uh, got access to the political levels of planning as well. And this then led further to different kind of projects. And um, um, for some of you that were here uh, last, last Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. um, we ha you had this uh, very interesting um, uh, discussion and talk about uh, dialogue processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we also have been uh, very much engaged in that in several projects, uh, we wanted to uh, continue uh, that dialogue and focus more on one specific project, which is also maybe the most problematic from an 
uh, I would assume from an artistic point of view. Uh, and in this project, the Jorbe Dialogen, uh, we choose to, or we got the possibility, you can say, to uh, have a position uh, within the municipality. Uh, we got, uh, got a position at the office of, uh, at the Department of Strategic Planning at the municipality of Haninge. Um, As process, process leader yeah. to um, work with this Jordbro uh, Dialogen, um, citizen dialogue which had already uh, going on for a while, uh, a year, mm -hmm. started up very encouraging, but then uh, the interest failed. And also this is a place where, as we talked of uh, last Tuesday, kind of tired for all these projects, people coming there trying to do something. And then uh, after two years, uh, they're going somewhere else, yes. sort of. And also, what if you should <coughs> should generalize a bit about this Jobro dialogen? Uh, when it started in Jobro, you I guess you're, most of you are familiar with the uh, with Jobro as society, or at least with the image of it. Um, and when it when it started this Jobro dialogen, it was some kind of as a as a way to 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 work with this local community to to build it. Also, in relation to, for example, low voter turnout, a lack of, uh, uh, you can say you had you had you had you had some kind of social polarizing going on within this community, and when it started, it started very much as as, you, as this image of a citizen dialogue that you have politicians and maybe um, officials on the scene, and then you invite uh, uh, the citizens to come and listen and ask questions, and maybe also form some, some groups working around certain issues. But as Anna said, when, when we, uh, we had been working in before, so when we, we knew about this when we got the position, that it had um, been going on for this a while. And, when and we also interested for us to see what is the difference, being an artist engaged in this area, working with sort of the same issues and then having a position mm. in the municipality. Of course, we know there's a, a difference, but what, what difference is it really uh, when you have another voice? Yeah. And we wanted to explore that yeah. ourselves as well. And we also but wanted to, to shift actually the way that you worked with, with this dialogue in this place. Uh, that was also one of the aims. But I think the role here is really interesting. I think we can maybe come back to it in the discussion later because this is, of course, one of the main um, uh, issues that you need to, to discuss is what power you come with. What power do you bring in as an artist, in a sense, like the free artist or independent artist coming to these kind of areas working? Or what power do you uh, bring with you if you come with uh, holding a position from the municipality, for example? Anyway, we really think there is... Uh, oh, sorry. I thought there was an unknown. We think there is a field that we need, need to develop or we are interested in dealing with. And if you see this as the municipality, it's really heavy, squared and very hierarchic and very... This is like the administrations, the stuprör we know of. And the citizen and the associations are much more dynamic and diverse and really organic structure. And how, how, do, how do we work with this area, really? How do... This interface is almost not existing, I think, today. Mm. Uh, and that's what we try to sort of yeah, and, engage and in. And one really important thing that we, that, we, that we also saw, it, it was that you um, also you need, you need to, to at least think of and, and work with the top-down perspective, but you also need to work as much within the, uh, within the, um, within the administrations and between the administrations within, in the municipality. So the dialogue must take place uh, as much here as there. Yes, and some uh, examples of how we try to actually change um, the way of uh, more than to see dialogue as a tool, as actually someone mentioned just before we started to talk. I think we see it more like a way of uh, thinking more than it's a tool. But anyway, sort of the methods uh, was to find these key persons 
that connects a lot of these dots. Uh, persons that really already are there mm. and uh, that has a network already and that we would not initiate ourselves what the dialogue would, should be about, mm. but we will really take, mm. oh, take the initiatives um, yeah. and support. And it could be... Uh, no, the, yeah, but that's, that's right. But also, what, what I was thinking was re referring also to... Um, for example, all this no, in Tesalo that was here talking yesterday uh, or, or last Tuesday. Um, of course, it's really hard also to enter an area with a, with a lack of confidence in the municipality or with, with officials, for example. So it's also a way of and why should they trust us in a sense? There might be no reasons for it. So it's also a matter of actually um, building trust in a in a in a just way, I would say, um, and the. And key persons yeah. here also are uh, essential in this. Essential, and mm. and we we offer them sort of doing our job, like consult mm. consulting mm. business. So it's not like just using them; they they got paid in some sense. Mm. In there, yeah. I'm sorry. Shall I talk more louder or clearer? Um, Another example, it's yeah. not only citizens, it, yeah. yeah, it's also connecting other initiatives. Uh. Yeah, so it's in, in the former case, it was connecting, for example, the, um, the landlords with, with uh, citizens and also with the municipality. But anyway, uh, let's go further to, because I think this is maybe also one of the key uh, notions I think we should bring with us. Um, often when you, dis uh, when you uh, discuss dialogues, you have, have the image of a dialogue as something in, in order to avoid conflicts. And in some cases that could be, of course, uh, uh, vital. But I think we have also the experience that you know, dialogues could really be, be a way to, 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 uh, to see the conflicts. And then you have to solve them in, in some sense. Maybe, maybe you don't that even not sol solve them. Just yeah, but the dialogue no, might not solve deal them. Deal with them. Yeah. But yeah. Yes. Should we take this Yes, example? I think this is interesting because... <laughs> uh, do you want to... Should we... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, but no. Uh, I think we're no. like stumbling no. also. It's a language issue yeah. also. No, like, but oh, this oh, is oh, interesting oh. because this is both <laughs> interesting and problematic. Yeah. So, um, because this is one example where, where, where the dialogue actually uh, had an, an effect on, on the plan on the planning program, because, um, and this is also very much uh, uh, due to the planner, we would say, that worked with this program. Um, during, the, during our time in Europe, they were working with this uh, planning program. And uh, uh, the, the aim for the pro program was to, to do a program where they should, should t uh, turn down a, a culture house, a temporary culture house, in order to build a new one, but still they would turn down really important, a really important place in Jordan. A place where there had been movements from the ground working, there were uh, libraries, there were a lot of interesting uh, things going on. But the planner, due to the dialogue and to the information coming up in the dialogue, chose to, very much by herself, to also add another uh, alternative. alternative, where at least part of this uh, house should stay. And I think this, is, uh, this was, of course, like a huge political turbulence around this. A lot of hard critique against her. And the dialogue. And the dialogue. Mm. Uh, but I think it's really interesting that she actually had the gut to do this. And then once again, then it's a matter for the politicians, in a sense, to decide how to deal with it, of course. Suddenly they had two options. And these options, of course, had always been there. But the, the, the thing was that now they were also, were also in the planning program. Mm -hmm. And I think this was um, um, really One beneficial. Major. Okay, oh. we, let's just stay, stay here. Mm. Ella. Yeah, so mm. this is what we think is really important to... Some of the things that we really think is important to think of. It's trust. Do we have trust when we enter these dialogues? How can we build trust? Do we want to build trust? Language, of course. 
it's not just different kind of languages like English, Swedish, and so on. It's also how you express yourself within different communities. Bureaucratic language, the language on the wall there. Mm. Power, what position do you talk, talk from or we talk from? What power do, do, you, do you have the people that you talk to or talk with? Do we want some kind of equal level when we talk and can we achieve it? It's not possible maybe, but no. at least an awareness. Yeah. That's okay. We'll okay. Cut. We'll stop there. Thank you. Yes, Yeah. Your clock. I'll just turn my phone off. Yeah, but I like to just keep my pace. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, keep it fast. <laughs> so, um, that, yeah, thank you for the um, that the first presentation, which really touches on everything I'm going to talk about, actually. Rooms, making room to come into that room. Um, the sort of role that you might have, but I'm particularly talking about the role of art and how do you make space for art so that it can actually have resonance. Uh, Muff, as a practice, so my background is architecture, but Catherine Clark, one of the other founding partners, is a practicing artist and her background was art practice and over the years like a marriage probably we've we've perhaps given each other more territory of our own territory whereas in the early days we were trying to sort of find out how to share the same pencil and that the power of the um, collaboration is when you can you know one perhaps offers both a mirror and a support structure for the other so I'm just going to particularly talk about a project which has been, um, I've talked about in Stockholm so many times, but still it, apparently it's resonant. And it's probably resonant because things are so appalling in London that I am like the ghost of Kiss Christmas future. Yeah, this is what it's going to be like for you. If you make too many public-private relationships and try to, you know, imagine that if people are trying to make the most money that they're going to care about some of the things that don't necessarily have a commodity value. So, um, yeah, hi. Um, so Catherine now and again makes projects where they, they don't have to merge into development plans exactly, but perhaps the development project has made some money to do it. So this is an image from Art Camp which was a project that lasted for four years and it always happened in buildings just before they were developed. The idea that these children will hold the longest living memory of the former use. So this is in a former psychiatric hospital and taking on loose parts play of the idea of multiple variables rather than the very fixed possibility of meaning. Um, but just to describe, you know, how, what is the methodology of making rich public spaces? And the truth is that good work requires an accuracy, that we have attempted to create that accuracy by recognising that generally the people that write briefs are the people spending the money, and therefore there is quite a lot that isn't there. Because whether it's there, not there from experience or from expediency or from aspiration of what they would like to be there. And so, um, you know, close in anthropology, close hanging out is a technical term. And it's the idea of getting under the skin of a situation so that you become part of that situation. Now, the difficulty, and that's something which Muff in different ways try to do, is how to be in a situation long enough to understand it. Now, you know, there's a, a lovely essay uh, which asks the question, can architects be socially responsible? And after 30 pages, Margaret Crawford answers no, because the sheer expensiveness of architecture means that the architect will always be agent of somebody else's agenda. And as agent, perhaps all you can be is a double agent, 
if you, in, at least in the case of Muff, oh, we made this eccentric commitment to only work in the public sphere. So we're trying to make more public these briefs. Um, so what happens when you mainly hang out with developers, when you're sitting in very endless meetings, these meetings that you referred to, I suppose what we feel is, how do we stay in the room long enough, i.e. not get sacked, behave in a professional manner, in order to wedge the door open for those other things which haven't been there to complete the brief. And in order to make it speedy, I'm just going to really talk about the methodology of both making a space for art practice and then what that meant in terms of resonance of putting it there. And I think we've seen this really powerful example in your work where you're actually able to change a master plan so Barking Town Square, this, um, the commission was at, at the end of 2004, 2005, in this piece of London, on the edge of London, the end of the tube line, where there'd been no private investment for 60 years. So some, a quite familiar place probably for you here, are the places with no private investment for a long time. And um, all of a sudden, all, this thing, all the buildings that are coloured green were being built within four years after nothing having been built. And um, all of them came with a deal. So in return for 200, 400, 300 private flats, little pieces of civic space were given back to this poor neighbourhood. So it seems kind of familiar to the territory that this exciting new project will be working in. And we came into this situation trying not to be seduced by the promises, the promises of a sunny place to sit in the sun. So this is an analytical drawing showing that where these new buildings were positioned, that's the sun there, that's south, uh, um, where they were positioned meant this, this area for sitting in the sun would actually be full of shadow and wind. And the original site was L-shaped. So there it is. This is the town hall. Yellow just signifies that these are buildings that will be open in the evening, early evening, up to 10 o'clock. So there was some potential for it. And the architect, you know, the architect in me, the architect in us, made an impulsive first move, which was to say, if it's going to be shady, fill it up full of trees. And to fill it full of trees, mature trees, was a political act because this is a part of the city without trees. The only trees were in the park, which was where the workers were supposed to go on Sundays. Um, but it was also to say, what's wrong with gloominess sometimes? You know, maybe there has to be a place for those sad the days, the best and worst of days of our life. So that was the design. And what you see here is that the L shape has become a T shape. Can everyone see that? I want to ask a question. Uh, who comes from architecture in this room? Who comes from art? And then, oh, then there's a load of other people. So all assumptions of who was coming, you must write down what you do at the end of it. Um, and so, yes, the L shape became uh, the T shape became an L shape because this was an art commission. And so it was an art commission which we there was open brief. We were able to say where we'd like to put it. And where we said we'd like to put it would be to complete the square. And um, it required, yes, a lot of sitting in rooms. In our case, sitting with um, uh, an architecture practice, HMM, just sort of, in just like your example, chipping away at the design and being able to do it from the perspective of public space. And we were able to support the architects because we were, going to be, were able to argue on behalf of public space for different organisation of the footprint of the buildings and in doing so embed it in the city. And I think these opportunities of having, in a way, the scapegoat, the fall guy, the architect can blame it on those annoying, artistic, weird women with the stupid name, meant that we could, you can actually expand the conversation and in doing so allow other things to happen. This incredible anxiety and it, you know, I think it, it can sit with any psychoanalytic reading of a situation about what people might do. So, um, you know, what might people do on a bench? So we made the bench sacrificial. 
we made it pink, we made it out of timber, so that when people wrote their names in it and burnt it, it could be just swept up. You know, it could be this object of anxiety. Of course, what happened was people sat on it. And into this moment, Catherine... But, and, and the reason we said, let's make it out of the timber, so we can make it easy when it all goes wrong. And I think to find places for people's anxiety about change... Um, and so at this point, the project to begin to develop a public art project um, commission came in and Catherine was able to, in a sense, enact some of these same moves, but doing it from a completely different discipline and perspective. And so rather than, you know, colouring in pictures showing where the wind will be, um, she enacted fantasies of what public space might hold you know, alongside the anxiety of what would happen with a bench. And so working with young people who attended the drama school behind the town hall, and this is when I'm, this is the, the town hall steps which face onto this square, they were able to en enact it in, in the place. And out of that came the bit called art. So this sits on the end of that T-shape facing these new buildings um, I'd, and there's the, the bench of wickedness with people sitting on it. And it sits there in a sense like a memento mori. So it's a deliberate, we built a ruin. And we built a ruin because what we found, and perhaps Muff is, you know, the, our work, there's a lot of mapping, of establishing what the existing assets are before you bring something in. And what we found was a sense of loss that all that sudden building meant that a continuous relationship with the past had been fragment fractured. And so we bought some past. Um, we went to a reclamation yard and in two hours just bought a whole lot of fragments. Um, it was one of a pleasurable, unusual moment of, of Catherine and I, the office is, um, fi the studio is 15 at the moment, you know, of us, the two of us going out together and just shopping and spending about uh, 30,000 euros on bits, including 10,000 bricks. And then after that came this exacting process of, with Photoshop, making this invented um, building. And it's one which has ca gathered myths around it. People talk about have, remembering it before the war, that it, it was the former library re being reconstructed and it's the place when, where many um, pigeons now lived. But because that, that sense of loss, this was a place where um, Fords uh, built cars, that were big um, histories of making. And so here the participation came with the makers themselves. So um, working with master bricklayers at the local building college and young apprentices, um, we practice because it's really hard to build cracks and then that became a building project and it sits there as um, a challenge people were very negative about it we had huge support so the support came from the pub local authority and it was sitting behind wraps it was completely separate to the other commission to make the public square which came as the side um uh, sort of, um, yeah, came as a side reward for all those private flats. And so its autonomy was really important. And I think this is, is, is very relevant to your project. It was an Thomas commission. So if we were seen walking into the town hall, because we weren't allowed to visit the town hall because we were working for the developers, we could say that we were there having a conversation about the folly, as we called it. But it meant that we were able to drop hints that it might be a good time to question the developer because the mature trees otherwise might be this big. And um, it just made, in a way, that territory, the little wedge in the drawer to build in um, other conversations. And so what, having protected that space of making, what it then allowed was for risks to um, be undertaken because the project was built in phases over five years. Every time another 200 f f uh, private flats was built, another piece of public realm was built. And so risks were allowed to be taken. And but the fact of the folly sitting there and everyone loved it meant that rather than our first moves where the most radical thing we could proffer was a wooden bench, 
and some pink granite from um, Spain. As, we, as the project went on, we were able to then fill that um, space with mature trees, make um, a woodland setting, introduce commissions with others. These, this is a piece um, working with two students from uh, the Royal College of Art. And lastly, whereas at the beginning of the project, there'd been thus that anxiety about human presence and the uncontrolled, that you wouldn't want people sitting on a bench. By year five, um, we were being pushed by our developer to actually take the risk of making a place for play. So I think this is just something about that idea of those two processes being parallel, the one of the wedging open of the door in order to thicken the brief and to bring in a d level of detail that isn't necessarily coming from its first um, point source. And the second is the value of protecting, and there was an act of protecting, that space for the uncontrolled and the open-ended and the lovingly made. And in doing so, that it didn't then become a rebuke to the rest of the project. Rather, it actually raised the game. And in the end, it was our builders for the main bit of public space who um, found the bricklayers who built the folly. So this, the dialogue came, this sort of dialogue that sat you know, on that process of making. Anyway, I hope this is relevant. I really thought it was great, the previous um, presentation. Thank you very much. to sit down like a singer-songwriter at a bar. <laughs> that was a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> just wait for this to load. Um, perhaps I can introduce myself in a disciplinary sense. Um, as Joanna uh, said earlier, I'm an urban planner um, and urban designer and a PhD student at the KTH School of Architecture here in Stockholm. Um, right. <clears throat> so my aim with um, today's talk was really to do some definition work um, from perhaps within the theory kind of side of things. Um, I hope it's not too boring after the last two fantastic presentations, but my aim really was to provide a kind of precision um, to the discussion and also to the critique, perhaps, of art in the planning process. Um, I'll start by reading, just to be more precise. Planning constitutes a practice and a discipline, but in the title of this talk, um, Art in the Planning Practice, we could suggest that it also can be figured as a kind of space, um, a very temp a specific temporal gap then between the present and then any number of contingent futures. It's uh, preemptive. It's an in-between that's kind of purgatory-like. Uh, it's not, after all, unusual to hear developers speak of their projects getting stuck in planning as if it was a kind of room um, or limbo. Um, and in this sense, it's drain uh, drenched with a kind of latent potential, an excess of potential futures, a kind of in-between, perhaps, without which the future is not possible, to quote um, philosopher Liz Gross. So planners operate on the border then, perhaps, between the virtual and the actual. They police a boundary um, via the insertion of a gap, a delay, a pause. Permission, um, I think that's my second one, right. Permission to enter this space of planning, um, to sit at the table, is thus, we might pose, uh, permission to make an entry into the future city. I mean entry both in the sense of gaining ingress to enter, but also in the sense of making a recording, um, an entry in a diary or a journal. So this, it might be argued, is what planning is about. The who, where, what, and on what terms um, an entry could be made into the future. Relying on the means of production of developers, the practices and products of architects, the ratifying opinions of a public, and ultimately on the delegated power and even violence of the state, um, the agency of planning, its content even, is both borrowed and distributed. Um, given that 
planning has recourse to such violence, um, it cannot be autonomous from the state. Its arenas cannot be and literally should not be allowed to uh, be decoupled from the broader mechanisms of democratic governance. For me, this is what accountability, another thing on my list, refers to. The presence of clear, traceable links to the institutional mechanisms of a functioning representative democracy. Um, it's only through such mechanisms that democratically legitimate decisions about who, where, what and what term entries into a future might be made can themselves be made. Um, I could add to this list depending on time, um, that we could also perhaps um, read planning then as a technology, a kind of container technology perhaps, which holds a content but also works upon it and manipulates it. And finally, um, I guess then we might um, situate it as a very fragile technology exposed to the wishes of politicians um, and via them the demands of citizens and capital. It's at constant risk of dissolution. Um, in a postmodern situation where we no longer have the autonomy of being a scientist, um, planning is oh so political and thus fragile. So this art in planning then... Um, I think that in the last 10 years, we could note a kind of agglomerated fascination with the uncoolest of disciplines, um, the bureaucratic and definitely less glamorous than architecture, at least, um, discipline of planning. The space of planning has become kind of strangely popular and populated. Um, and this might be for several reasons, which I, I won't go into at length, but the first might be a kind of obsession in general with um, the urban. Uh, and here we could point to the work of LSE, um, London School of Economics and their Urban Age Project as one such kind of marker of a discourse around the economic primacy of urban centres, an urban obsession. Um, and national policy, even within the Swedish context, um, is certainly picking up this theme of kind of putting architecture on a separate level um, and, and rather referring up one scale to, to the importance of the urban itself. Um, so if that's a kind of shift in context, we could also talk about then um, perhaps art is interested in planning as a cause. Um, in preceding the built environment, so in constituting the kind of unbuilt environment, we might say, um, planning seen as the cause of deficiencies which we note in the city around us. Because it came first, it can be kind of blamed. Um, at the same time, it might be a, a kind of sense of crisis even. Um, planning is a site where democratic def deficits are revealed, they're exposed, um, disempowerment becomes visible and the privatisation of governmentalities that we see under the current neoliberal regime presents itself very forcefully. Um, the topic for this discussion then is means or ends and I guess... Um, get my timer up. Right. Um, I might suggest following uh, perhaps the work of Isabel Stengez, uh, the philosopher, um, in making a distinction between rather than referring to cause and effect, maybe rather talking about case. Rather than cause, we might in fact talk about case and rather me than means or ends, we might talk about this cause case dilemma. I feel like that might be somewhat more productive. So, Participatory art, why, why has it been, participatory social art, um, why has it been kind of so interested in planning? Well, I guess that um, if we could follow the work um, much probably oversighted now, the critique um, mounted by Claire Bishop in 2012 at the end of a huge glut of kind of participatory projects, um, she makes the point that uh, at each kind of historical moment art might take a different form, but it seeks to negate different artistic um, and socio-political objects in relation to a kind of set context. So here each case addresses a broad set of issues, of causes. Um, and, and in the current post-political um, moment, we might say that then planning is addressed as a cause. It's a cause of the apparent absence of a viable left alternative. It's a cause of the emergence of contemporary post-political consensus. It's even sort of implicated in the near total marketization of art and education. This is... Um, uh, but it, it, this is not unproblematic, I guess. And the point made by Bishop, which has been reiterated so many times, but I'll just pop it up there one more time, is that the paradox of this situation is that even though participatory artists 
invariably stand against neoliberal capitalism, the values they impute to their work are understood formally, um, that is, in terms of opposing individualism or the commodity object, without recognising that so many other pra um, aspects of their practice dovetail perfectly with neoliberalism's recent forms, that is, the networks, mobility, projects, effective labour. So here we, we confront this dovetail, and I, in putting this together, I was wondering why it's always used, this trope. Um, something always dovetails with neoliberalism. If you read this literature, it's repeated again and again and again. This damn wooden joint is used to talk about one of the most important kind of political moments uh, that we're living through. So what is this dovetail? Um, and I guess my question then is, if neoliberalism is the name that we might give to modes of post-democratic, authoritarian governmentality, which attempt to align all aspects of life uh, with capitalist valorization, then um, where does this dovetail land? How can we talk about it in a, in a meaningful way? How can we get around the critique that simply says that art um, simply kind of aligns art with a sort of unwitting um, instrumentalization under the hands of, of, of a global hegemonic capital? How, where do we go from here? So <laughs> um, I guess that we could say um, then that we could uh, add precision to that critique by talking about um, some of the risks of art um, being involved in a, in a structure like planning. The first, I don't think we need to go into um, in, in particular detail, but it would be the introduction of new regimes of valorization. So here we could think gentrification, um, bringing new values to an area um, that can then be commodified. The second is much more interesting, though. Um, in my view, one of the key points or um, strategies of, of a kind of neoliberalization is a privatization of government. So here we would see um, a marked and active contribution to kind of dismantling the state. And here art might be implicated via either a vehement critique of regulation and representative democracy. Um, and I note that um, non-plan as a text is being used in public discussions in Sweden to support artistic intervention. And I find that really problematic. Um, the second would be in an erosion of legitimacy um, of democratic functions through non-mandated, non-accountable decision making. The third, getting more interesting, that one's like, we can put that those two aside, would be um, the notion of the entrepreneur of the self, the, um, the figure of neoliberalism. Um, so here we would see an encouragement for art audiences and art artists both to take up externalised or privatised or abandoned functions of a decaying welfare state um, and to become kind of entrepreneurs who take that upon themselves. And then fourth, and moving into a conclusion, um, at the time it's the same time that we see people being pushed into individual subjectivizations. There's more kind of machinic, um, automatic behaviours being stimulated. So um, for management companies like social networks or research engines, for polling firms, data banks, market studies, um, and so on, we're becoming not really subjects but rather platforms for exchange and transformation um, transformation of information, forced to constantly communicate our opinions. So these are four injunctions that I see as forming the dovetail. We're all sick of the Marxist, Marxist critique of participation. We know the, the line, artists are unwitting agents in the service of capital. At the same time, I think the fine point, uh, the fine print of this critique is important. I think we need to discuss it. Um, so planning um, is a technology for the management of possible futures, and as a technology, it can be put into the service of the state or of capital or of society. It's both... Um, a a case and a cause. And I guess in looking at this interaction then, it's planning itself, I would argue, um, that's at stake in this interaction, both in the most affirmative and positive sense, but also in the kind of darkest sense possible. So, uh, thanks. <laughs> that was really quick. <laughs> Stay here? Yeah.